there, uh, go to the next slide, we'll get rid of those words there. Uh, and you'll see there's a painting I did. I'll talk about this for a minute. Hey, welcome to Paint with Alex. And uh, that, that painting there is, I was at a wedding. I was invited to go. We can't seem to get it on the screen. Next slide. No? Slide. Next slide. Oh, whatever. I had a great time, man. I do weddings and bar mitzvahs and things like that. And, oh, there it is. Um, it is so much fun for me to capture uh, a moment in that way, a uh, special moment, and you're just, you're in, the, you're there, you're kind of collecting the colors and the feeling and the people and the environment and the, and the vibe, and uh, it's, you know, every bit as much as you would be a photographer or something like that, you know? And it was really awesome. God, two awesome people in an awesome place. And it um, wasn't a huge crowd. It was just like gorgeous, close friends and a lot of happiness. And so, man, that was fun. And um, you know what really helped me a lot, too? I think I've showed it, uh, showed it to you guys on this show before. The little the viewfinder. I brought my little viewfinder. And then uh, I also brought two media with me. I brought acrylic, which I used to just smash in, uh, block in, <coughs> excuse me, some quick color for an underpainting. And then I brought oil. So in the same day, I was able to kind of do two layers of paint. And, um, you know, in that first stage, you want to, well, what that first stage is, the blocking in, is what we're going to talk about today. Today, uh, next slide, the, the show is called uh, Squared Up and Blocked In. And um, so you got, a, you got a little grid there, and then you got that, uh, you got that gray scale that is my obsession. And we're gonna use both of those things to help us tackle the two parts uh, of composition, okay? The lines here, this grid, lines, actually, are going to help us to find the lines of the composition. And the tones here are going to help us find the values, the lights and darks. Those are, those are the two main aspects of a composition. And again, we're talking about academic painting processes here, okay? I mean, fundamentally, the thing that I love to learn about and experiment with are all the parts and processes and steps and whatnot that the Italian and the French painters from the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century were playing around with and experimenting with. <coughs> Excuse me, I got this peanut in my throat. Peanut in my throat. Um, so, uh, so squaring up and blocking in two, squaring up is the first tool that we'll talk about today. And we got some slides that are going to show us some art historical examples of artists using this technique across the ages. Okay, so um, next slide, what do we got? Can't remember what's next. Oh, right, well, this is what we're going to paint a photo. Oftentimes, you'll find a photograph that you like and you want to do a painting of it. And we're going to give you some tips and ways to think about getting a painting going from this photo. Okay, now we're working again with black and white. You could experiment with and learn about painting for years working in black and white. Go for it. It's awesome. And again, so we're taking color out of the picture. We're just going to deal with lights and darks exclusively. And, uh, you know, just a little comment on this uh, artist here. This is a photographer named Mark Nash, and he was kind of a, the generation of high glamour New York Mad Men era photographs, and he worked for Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and Vanity Fair and all, you know, Mademoiselle and W Magazine and, and sh just amazing photographers, these guys. There's a whole gang of these amazing photographers. And I think they're also just kind of hung out with the amazing illustrators from that same era. These guys to me, okay, this is a black and white photo and it is a gorgeous composition. Um, 
These guys really looked back in the day. I'm still looking at that camera. These guys still thought back in the day, really they looked for a compelling composition in the lights and darks, because if you're in black and white, it's kind of what you've got, you know. And um, so I, I picked this, this image and we're gonna work with it. I jingled it a little bit in Photoshop just to make sure that everything was, was vertical. It was kind of a little bit off from the original and I just, I don't know, I went in to, to distorted it just slightly to make everything kind of 90 degree angles and whatever. Um, and I'm not gonna worry about copyright or whatever. We're not gonna be trying to make money off of this. And arguably, doing a painting, especially when you're just you're eyeballing it and you're painting from hand or whatever, um, that is transformative enough, I think. I don't know, I mean, it's, it's an argument we could make these days. Some people really worry about it and um, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not collaging anything or, or what have you. I'm, I'm creating a new painting from my eyes to my hands to the canvas. I don't know. Um, uh, now, okay, so we're gonna tackle two parts of this composition. And the first thing that we're gonna tackle is the line, okay? Um, so if we go to the next slide, that's where we're gonna talk about what squaring up is, squaring up. Uh, the, okay, there's the artist's name, yeah, Mark Shaw. Now here, it might be hard to see, hopefully not too hard to see, uh, but this is a, uh, a Peter Paul Rubens painting. <coughs> and it's a, a, a compositional grouping, a figure of compositional grouping. And uh, you can see that he has drawn a light grid over the composition. Um, it might, again, it might be difficult to see, uh, but this is an example of an artist who took a drawing and then he squared the drawing up in order to transfer the drawing to another surface and also simultaneously enlarge or reduce uh, depending on your grid. Um, if we go to, let's go to another one. So there's Peter Paul Rubens. I think we got his name. You can, or, or no, oh, I'm sorry. That was Veronese. Okay. Uh, so yeah, okay, we started with the Italians. Veronese, that's Rubens there, doing the same thing. You see that grid there? The grid did not come first. All right, I remember I had a teacher that uh, was, would look at this, uh, taught about, uh, and, and, I, and I showed it as one of the slides that's coming up. It was an Ang drawing by an artist named Ang, I-N-G-R-E-S. And um, this is Rubens here. Uh, and, and this Ang drawing is a woman and there's a grid over her face. And all we see is the finished drawing. We don't know, we don't, we have to know what he did first. And I was taught mistakenly that Ang drew the grid first and then tried to sort of fit the female's head into this proportion. And that, that's not true. That is a misunderstanding on the part of that teacher that I had. The drawing came first. The grids are always lightly drawn on top as a means of transferring. Okay, let's go to the next slide. There's Rubens. This is that Ang drawing I'm talking about with that very light squares over her face right there. That was not drawn because he was trying to do some idealized proportioning or something like that. Again, it was done to transfer this onto another surface to either paint or what have you. So next slide, that'll show his name. It's a weird spelling. I'll step out of the way there. Ingress, it looks like ingress, but it's a French word and it's pronounced angra. Anger, angra, angra. I'm not quite sure, it's one of those. Let's go to the next one. Because we, again, this is a throughout time. Okay, that Veronese was from the 1600s. I mean, maybe the 1500s. The Rubens was from the 1600s. The Angre, the Ingress, the Ang, the Anger, Ang, French guy, that was from the 1800s. Here's Degas. Next slide, is, there's his name, Degas. And uh, Degas, here he is gridding up this, this drawing of, that he's done here of, uh, of this ballerina. We've even got, uh, this is a great example. Go to the next one. An artist that you all know, world famous artist. He saw this poster of a Japanese show, of a, of a show in Paris of Japanese 
graphic art. And he so became enraptured with this image that he traced it. Next slide. He traced it right off the poster, and then he gridded up his tracing, and then he used that to make the painting that you'll see in the next slide. And this is Vincent van Gogh. Or just call him Vincent if you can't pronounce Van Gogh right. I don't think I'm even doing it right. Van Gogh. He would have he's spinning in his grave if he heard you pronounce his name. Van Gogh. He got you like God. Call me Vincent, please. Um, so wow, it's a cool tool. It is something that you could use. Oh man, like if you're do, blowing up murals, that kind of thing, where one inch on your drawing is a foot, and you're going to make something suddenly five inches, five feet, and 15, 20 inches to 20 feet, you know, it works like, like magic. But how does it work? Well, you've got like something that you want to get onto your canvas. Could be your line drawing. It could be, you know, like uh, Vincent here traced, uh, um, traced this Japanese drawing that he wanted to copy. And so uh, the canvas is blank. And then you've got your drawing. Uh, you need to create something that these two surfaces have in common, okay? And the easiest thing to do is to make a grid. Let's just go to the wide shot or the close-up on the, on the canvas. Is to make a grid. Well, uh, yeah, so uh, here's the image that we're going to work with. Let's go to the closer shot. I know we got one more shot. Somewhere. There, it's loaded up. Yeah, almost. Nope. There. Yes. All right. See, now this grid here, uh, this canvas, I'm sorry, this is an 18 by 14 canvas, and this is the, uh, this is the image that we're going to paint here. And uh, the image is not exactly the same proportion as a ready-made store-bought canvas panel, okay? So the image here is uh, it's 18 by 12 and a half inches. So this is 18 by 14. I cropped in with tape three quarters of an inch on either side here, just taped it off. And that makes it the exact same aspect ratio as the image that I'm going to block in today. But we're still in the squaring up stage. So you got to have this, this, and this canvas. One thing they got in common is they're the same proportion right now, even though they're not the same size. So let's say this is a 3 by 4 proportion. This is a 3 by 4 proportion. But this is 11 by something, and this is you know 18 by something. So same proportion, different size. That is something that they have in common. And right now, without even a grid, you could just do what's called an eyeball. Just eyeball it. You're like, you could just take a pencil or any kind of mark-making implement, and you could just kind of go, well, she's kind of right about here, and uh, there's a window that goes about like that. And there's, you know, this, this artist is off in the corner. And you just start to eyeball it. You put shapes on the canvas, and one thing leads to another. And relationally, you start to get something going on. Now, another thing uh, that you can do is create another thing that they have in common, besides that they're the same proportion, OK? And that would be some kind of marks, OK? The simplest thing that people do, the oldest tradition is squaring up. You create some sort of a grid over your drawing and on your canvas that are the same. Okay. You know, we use a grid. It doesn't have to be squares, even though we call it squaring up. Okay. If you have to make it squares and that makes it a pain in the butt, then don't use squares. The first thing I do is I just subdivide the image in the middle. Okay, so I, have, I draw a line, or here what I did is I just taped thread instead of drawing lines, because maybe you don't want to ruin your drawing because it's from a book or whatever. I taped a thread right down the middle vertically and right down the middle horizontally. 
So I got a crosshair that goes right up and down. And then I draw a line on the canvas. Maybe you can't see it, maybe you can. But I have a crosshair horizontally and vertically. All right? So now I got four little rectangles. I do the same thing. Now I subdivide this equally, vertically twice, equally horizontally twice. And then I get 16 little squares to this grid, which I've drawn with one, two, three, four, five, six lines, okay? Now the thing about squaring up is you can overdo with the squares, all right? There is a limit to where the squaring up becomes not helpful. So if I drew like quarter inch squares on this canvas, and then I drew like eighth inch squares on my photo or my drawing or whatever I'm copying or transferring, and I'm sitting there going, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, over, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. Okay, wait, hold on, one, two, three, four, five, six, is, is that square, that square? There's a point where it becomes too many squares and it defeats the purpose of making it simple. I really find that if you subdivide it vertically and horizontally equally three times, okay, that that is usually more than enough to, uh, to start to get your composition well placed uh, on your canvas. I could divide it again horizontally and vertically equally, you know, uh, however many times I want. Um, but we're just blocking in, okay, because we got another trick that we're going to show you after we block in. And today, kind of like the wedding party, um, I brought acrylic and oil. I don't know if we'll get, have time for oil, but we're going to block in with acrylic and we're going to think of it just like oil, exactly the same. I mean, you might as well just use the acrylic like oil, mix opaque colors and values and things like that, and um, just smash it in. We're going to smash it in. It almost behooves you with what we're going to show you after we do the block in it almost behooves you to be really raw and messy because it's easier in the long run to make big corrections, I find, than to make little teeny tiny millimeters. You gotta move one thing one millimeter and another thing another millimeter. I'd rather just get it in the right place but have to move it half an inch, you know? Um, so these are things that are fun to experiment with. The line, the color, different approaches to getting a, a, an image going on canvas. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me take a little sip of water and we'll take a, a four second break. Mm. 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 Ah. Back in the day, that, used, that would have been beer that I would have just chugged, but I don't drink beer anymore. Um, acrylic! Acrylic, you know, you can really use acrylic, you can really think of it like oil. Exactly the same, all right? Except, it, here's my brush cleaner that I use with acrylic, but instead of putting turpentine or gamsol or mineral spirits in there, I just put water, because water is the thinner for acrylic. You got it? So, uh, oh, glove time. I'm gonna glove up because I, I, I really like it. Like the gloves. Fan, the gloves. I think we got the right side. If you, if you put the gloves on a couple of times, you do have to make sure you don't put them on inside out when you put them on again. You gotta be careful, because then that's like really defeating the purpose. Um, Okay, so uh, gloves are on. We got brushes, of course, always. And when we're blocking in, we like big brushes, all right? Nice, good size here. We'll put these right down here. Large, messy, giant workhorse brushes. These go through an evolution. They do not come at the store looking like this. It takes a lot, it takes a couple of months of really beating them up to get that nice, jacked up, frayed, but really good, effective for blocking in, good stuff. And uh, then we got a few other, you know, blocking in always, you wanna go big brushes. 
You want to start with the large brushes and then move your way to the small brushes. You want to start with the big simple shapes and move your way to the small complex shapes later. All right. So uh, now instead of medium, like an oil-based medium, like liquin or uh, uh, galkid or neo medjulp, which is another one that I'm experimenting with, Gamblin makes it neo medjulp. Uh, uh, acrylic. This is the medium for acrylic. This isn't brush cleaner, just like liquin isn't brush cleaner. And water is not a medium, it's just a watering down agent, just like turpentine is a watering down agent for oil. So uh, acrylic glazing mediums, I like satin. I usually use acrylic for underpainting and I don't want it to be super glossy. So satin finish, good stuff. Um, oh. Uh, I, did I talk enough about squaring up? I guess. Uh, we'll, we'll jump back into it just because I, I moved on to the acrylic. Um, so here I have some acrylic white and uh, it's, it's a Liquitex. I, I use different brands. Lasco is a really good brand. This is gesso, acrylic gesso. And it says super heavy gesso, super heavy. So that means like I can open this up and I can like turn this upside down and it, and it won't come out. It's like thicker than, than uh, it's sour cream. It's heavy. Otherwise known as in painting parlance, short. This is short, stiff, heavy body, all the kind of the same words. Uh, and then I mixed up in a, just a, a a container that I ended up having because they run out and then I just keep them because they're still useful. Um, this is a black that I mixed up and it's mostly black gesso and then maybe a third of it is brown, uh, burnt umber, because I don't want the black to be too cold. I want it to try to be a neutral black, not a cold black or, a, or whatever. Um, if anything, I try to err on the slightly brownish side and I, and I don't think I succeeded. But when I'm doing acrylic and I'm mixing specifically uh, using it for underpainting, especially monochrome underpainting, here I've got my white and then I have a big nice container of a warm black that I am fond of. This could be any color, frankly. But what I do then is here's another container. I mixed up a big batch of middle value tint of this, all right? And uh, the one thing that, the one reason this helps is because acrylic doesn't dry the same value. Um, but if you have a big vat of acrylic that you know is the same and dries to the same value and you know how light you were mixing above it or how much darker you were mixing below it, it helps you to organize your values a little bit, a little bit. Um, but, the, um, and, and I painted a little swatch of that on the top of the jar here, if I walk up to the camera that had the close up there, you can see the value of it is, uh, eh, it's hard to see in the light here. The value of this is about middle gray. Middle gray, I, I'm finding my middle gray to be a little bit lighter than I usually have mixed it. Um, and so good to have, I got a big jar. So now I got a big jar of white, we'll go to the top down, big old jar of white, big old jar of gray middle gray and a big old jar of black. Man, I love acrylic. I use acrylic like it's going out of style. Is that the expression? I just use copious quantities and it dries so flat. You could lay the acrylic on with a spoon or a shovel or a, a rake and uh, once it dries, man, it's just flat. So. Um, I find that with underpainting, it helps with the super heavy gesso or the heavy body acrylic to have a little bit more texture um, and body to the paint. And, uh, and, and if you really work that paint, you work, be expressionistic with it and throw it around and handle it like oil, honestly, people can't tell the difference. I mean, they don't know. Uh, they can't tell. It's, I mean, me, I can tell, I, I obsess on it. And then, and then people have no clue. So just keep that in mind. Pe most people got no clue about what you're doing with painting. Oops, excuse me. Now, one last thing is we got, um, 
rags. I use rags when I'm painting with acrylic, not paper towels, because you're using water and the paper towels just, I don't know, they kind of just disintegrate and become useless really quickly when they get saturated with water, which doesn't happen with when they get saturated with oil. Um, so I got a couple of rags here. I'll rinse them out. I'll boil them to keep them clean so they don't smell. Or I'll spray a little schwitz, a little bit of rubbing alcohol in it to uh, keep them the mildew stink away. But they're clean. They're ready to go. I got two here and they're saturated. And um, so we're going to jump into this any second now. Now one more thing as we approach uh, the blocking in because we're hitting the 730 point, which means we'll have 30 minutes of painting, I guess, is um, I'm going to be doing what is, uh, you might, you're going to see me take my glasses off, okay? I'm going to paint without my glasses. Um, when you're blocking in an image, it really helps to get out of that left brain that is so organized and seems to think it knows so much and just respond to the colors and the lights and the darks that you're, are shining into your eye. And there's different ways you do that. One, you hear artists all the time, squint, okay? You've already heard me say it, and you'll hear me say it over and over. Squint, squint your eyes. You know, just to show you another trick that people used to use. This is a device that artists would look at the reflection of what they're painting with and it eliminates or it accentuates contrast. It groups the shadows down and it helps you more easily see what is clearly in the shadow in any particular composition versus what is clearly in the light in another composition. This is called a black mirror, black mirror. Yeah, it sounds scary and it's a scary TV show. Um, I watched that a few times and got really scared. But black mirror, you could make yourself a black mirror. Just all you need is a piece of glass or plexiglass and you paint the back of the glass with black acrylic. And then you let it dry and then maybe you give it another coat and then you just tape it onto a little piece of board or cardboard um, so it doesn't break and the back, the back of the paint doesn't chip off. And you can look at this, you see reflections of things when you look through it, but you see a more contrasty image. And uh, especially when you're blocking in, you want to kind of get that clear contrast um, established as soon as, as soon as you can, you know. And then, like I said, we have a trick up our sleeve at the end where, after we've splashed a bunch of paint onto this canvas in a willy-nilly uh, chaos with an intention. That's, that's what we do when we're painting. We, there is an end that we want to get to, and we do not have to know how to get there except for a few things. And uh, you are better off using some of the tips and ideas that I like to play with. You're better off in the beginning being more out of control than in control. Better to be out of control than in control. What are some other ways that artists help to get themselves a little bit more distanced and right-brained um, when they're looking at an image that they're trying to paint, like a photograph or a composition that they've worked up, is to turn it upside down. You know, that's like from drawing on the right side of the brain. That's one of the exercises. Take a photograph or find an image that you want to do a painting of. Turn it upside down and then draw it. And you do different things. You think different. Uh, when your proportions are forced to be uh, heads up and bottoms under and, and will make maybe more interesting decisions. It doesn't matter. You want to get out of your uh, tightness, you know. And uh, for me, taking the glasses off is such a great way to do it. Um, just another quickie, I guess. It's sometimes helpful to have a spray bottle when you're working with acrylic. That's a nice thing. Um, and because uh, acrylic dries really fast. We want it to dry fast today so that hopefully we can get to the second trick up our sleeve when it comes to uh, composing here. But uh, okay, 
we got our we got stuff we got things I'm gonna now if this was oil paint I would dip my brushes in my clean turpentine but it's acrylic so I'm dipping my brushes in a big vat of water that I just got to the side right there and I'm just gonna put my brushes I guess right here and uh, let's get a, a dollop uh, a good healthy dollop of some of this white this heavy body white gesso right there nice good size blob all right looks good and we'll grab some of our gray and the gray is more runny because uh, I used a different gesso with it but I kind of want it that way I sort of want the lights in my painting to have a little bit more impasto and uh, I sort of like my darks to be a little flatter. Sometimes I find darks in a painting uh, can be very irritating because they glare. Man, the glare off of a darks, especially if you got a dark with a lot of uh, impasto brush strokes, all you end up seeing is this velveting of these brush strokes. You don't see that blackness that you're trying to get. And uh, so we're gonna squeeze out some black here. The black's even kind of runnier, I guess. Um, and uh, you know, one thing, just a tip that I found that's helpful, if you buy this Gray Matters paper, I'm totally casting a shadow here. If you buy this Gray Matters paper, um, the value that dries to, uh, the, the value of the paper is acrylic when it's wet, it dries to middle gray if you match the value of the paper. It's very interesting. Um, okay. So what do we got here? We got our image that we're going to paint, and we got our canvas, and they've got a grid together, all right? Uh, the canvas is toned, by the way, and it's toned to a value. So you can see the canvas is, oh, it's right up in there. It's uh, darker than, it's lighter than middle gray, and it's a little darker than white. And um, so uh, we're going to take the glasses off right now, guys. We're going to get serious here, and we're just going to start to, and again, we kind of have to stand off to the side, and I'm not sure now if I'm casting a terrible shadow. Is it okay if I do this? Okay, so uh, middle gray. Um, we're going to, let's see. I would guess, actually, I'm going to actually put a little brush stroke right on there. I'm going to say this is going to be middle gray. So... We're going to block this in right here, this part of the floor, middle gray. And uh, it goes up to a little bit underneath the, um, the, uh, the first line. Maybe I do need my glasses um, just so I can still see that grid a little bit. But I'm going to squint like hell, guys. Uh, squint really hard. I think this might be over here. This might be a, some middle gray. All right. Um, I start to, maybe, I'm, maybe I want to grab a brush here that I'm just going to kind of load into my black here. And it's going to be more of de devoted and dedicated to dark, all right? Uh, so I'm definitely feeling like all over in here, this is dark. Let's just block in some dark over here. I'm feeling that dark in the corner. That's sort of, and as it's wet, I'm blending into the wet acrylic now, the middle gray that I laid in there. Um, I want to just get that wet gradation. I'm going to jump my brush. It blended up to get a little bit lighter, so I'm gonna jump it back into my gray here, I mean in my black, and I'm gonna to start to do the same thing. I'm gonna vignette this corner, and I'm gonna grab my gray brush now, and I'm gonna kinda of blend back into that. Maybe I'm gonna go back and forth a little bit. It's okay, we're just trying to get something going on on this canvas. Um, I'm feeling also some lights, so I wanna get some, I'm gonna jump over into my, into my light, uh, my acry uh, thick acrylic here. And then starting right about here, I'm definitely feeling this uh, gradation, all right? And, and there's this plane. Uh, well, it's definitely light up here to this window, a little bit past the, uh, that vertical line of the grid. And it's definitely right about here. I'm feeling light and it gets a little thinner. 
behind her right there. All right, so we'll smash that in. Um, I'm feeling, and, and you know, there's a, don't forget, it's back and forth, okay? But right about halfway here, I'm feeling there's this light that's on the top of this table surface. So I want to get that in, block that in. And I'm feeling this guy who's like right about here, back of his shirt, okay? Um, I'm feeling a little bit of light on this, like a, like a triangle right in here. Now I want to jump back to my black. So maybe I'll leave this brush right there. And oh, let's say, okay, let's say that her head, I'm going to start it right about here. I'm definitely overdoing it, the shape, or the, maybe even the value. But better to overdo it in the beginning. Um, now this, I'm just going to simplify this into another little triangular kind of a gradation that goes that way, okay? And uh, there's, it's, there's a lot of really, there's a lot of values between middle and dark that are, that are beautiful and subtle. There's a real dark, dark that's kind of right along the edge of this top right here, all right? And I'm definitely feeling this dark as it goes uh, down the desk, and it stops right about there, back into my dark. This desk, eh, it cuts across right about there, okay? That's called cutting in when you do that, when you do have something moving behind, and then you do kind of another shape in front of it. And this, this shape goes all the way down to about, oh, to about there, all right? And, and I'm seeing this guy's head, his head kind of pops up about the top, right about there. There's some more values probably in it than, I should, than I've just laid in there. But we're, we're being real bold and rough right now. It's okay. Um, got this. Get his legs. So, hey, you know, he's got his leg here, and then there's a kind of a shoe. This somehow, there's goes straight down and then another little shoe coming out here. It's all right. This is the fun part, man. You get to love this more and more. At least I do. Because this is when like dramatic things are happening. Big changes. Makes it very exciting. So let's go over here. I'm going to sketch her in and then I'm going to get rid of her. I'm kind of drawing her in. She's sort of a little shape like this. I think, uh, I think it'll help me to start to, let's just group everything down in here in the dark. Let's just get that dark, just like that. Um, now through the window, there's a, a lightness, but then there's also, you know, um, oh, thank you. Are those in the way? Oh, okay. Go a little forward. Am I leaning too far into it? I, I could definitely tell I'm casting a, a, a shadow. I'll try to stand back. I'll try to stand. Oh, am I like totally blocking it too? Ugh. No, you're good now. You're better now. We're better. Okay. Less shadow. Less shadow. Good. All right. Uh, I'm going to gradate this. Neat, neat, neat. You know, you see, it's starting to dry a little bit in some spots. Uh, I definitely want to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this like a big splotchy mess. Okay, so I'm going to lay in a good portion of, um, of kind of like dark, okay, just like this. And I'm going to cover it pretty bold, all right. And, and then I'm going to just try to find a way to just make it real like smoogy colors. Like maybe I'll just take a, a paper towel or something and uh, kind of get some, get some white and crinkle it up, you know? And then, I'll, and then through here, I'm just gonna kind of like try to put some of these little crinkles on here. Because it just looks like texture, you know? Leaves, lots of kind of like a staticky texture and contrast. And since we're just doing underpainting, it's kind of uh, okay to play with, you know, texture, everything you want to, everything that you've got to work with, man, 
you want to be playing with it, okay? So I'm coming in now. I'm doing, you got to, one thing you'll start to understand more is how the paint responds wet into wet. And, uh, you know, acrylic, certain colors are very weak and stuff. I'm really just going straight into my light, okay? And, uh, and my white, because I know that, like, it very quickly mixes with the wet paint that's underneath it. And, um, and turns dark, okay? But we want, we want that contrasty feeling of leaves. Leaves, and that, that might be working for me, you know? Um, so what I might do now is come over here. I may, sometimes what I'll do when I'm doing a copy of something is I will, I'll kind of touch a color onto the, onto the, the, the thing that I'm copying, the photo. But this value right about here, uh, and let's just guess that it's kind of right down the middle. I mean, uh, we've already got some stuff placed. Uh, so we're going to say this is uh, that, that window frame. And it's going to go, eh, you know, right about down to, to here, window frame. And uh, it starts to kind of gradate real fast. And I'm going to start to blend that into, we'll go to my middle brush here. Start to just blend that into that dark. Just lose it. Now this same line uh, at the top here gradates to kind of a dark. You know, maybe what I need to do is get a little, I'm going to get a big flat brush here and just get a few more light sort of textury brush strokes up in that area back in here. And you can see that the top uh, of this window jam is, is a dark. And then as it moves down, it gradates to light. Okay, so maybe we start it light and then we're going to gradate wet into wet and we get that dark up at the top. And that same kind of dark, you know, uh, we'll use it to do a little bit more drawing. It's sort of this color here and then it's going across just about like that. And then she's kind of got a line that goes right sort of through her head. Sorry. Right there, right there, through the head there. And we'll, we'll just sort of gradate that once again. We don't have to make things straight to start with. We don't have to make them um, look all perfect. Uh, there's, this is the underpainting. Feel free here, guys, to uh, make it a mess. It's OK. We've got these curtains up here. Maybe that feels like curtains. Um, got the door jam or the window frame over here. It's just kind of something weird going on there. I've really looked at it and I can't quite figure out like is that the, is that the dresser or whatever. But with the painting you can just kind of just fade it out or whatever. You know I'm just going to gradate this and then as we move down we get real dark down in here and we just kind of keep it like that. Okay, so you can see something's starting to happen. I mean, if we look at what we got on the canvas, let's go to the close-up shot. Um, we got something going on, right? I mean, can we just keep it on that for a minute? There. We got something going on that is starting to resemble one thing and the other. Uh, the, the, these shapes, some of these values, whatever. There's a, a, so, a, some more subtleties, like maybe Maybe we start this. Uh, maybe we start this part of his shirt here with the middle value, where the sleeve is, and kind of like the bottom of the folds here, and then we make sure to just kind of gradate all the way up, keep it soft right there. Put a little brush stroke kind of through there. Okay, now this is drying nice. I'm, I'm liking that this is drying good. Uh, I'm not really getting a lot of too many of the subtle values. Um, I try, I try to, um, or I find that when I'm going to get to the point where I'm really going to do subtle values, that 
I enjoy it more when I'm doing that with a, a oil paint. I just find it to be to work a little bit better. Um, you have you can be more deliberate with it. Uh, you can slow down. You know, with acrylic, you're kind of always sort of racing against the clock. Of uh, it's like drying as you speak, uh, as you're putting the you know like it's drying here on the palette even. You know? So it's sort of like, oh my God, I've got to keep going. Go, go, go. More paint. You know, uh, there's things you can mix with the paint that, that do their, that help, like retarders. They call them retarding medium. And um, I, don't, I don't use them, honestly. I, don't, I, I haven't found a good way to use retarding medium. Um, if someone's got tips on that, I will have you on the show and we'll do an acrylic painting together or something like that. Um, all right, I'll get a few more subtle values in here. You know, because for example, there, you could say, well, there's his skin tone, which is slightly lighter than his head. You know, here's the shape of his white shirt and shadow. Um, he's, got, uh, he, he's got this arm here is pretty dark. I mean, the painting or the photograph definitely things group together in the photograph. Um, and so shadows tend to maybe all just group together into a dark. And, uh, but with, a, with uh, your, your eye, you know, doesn't do that. It's kind of dynamically changes. And you can do that with paint. You can sort of paint both the shadow and the light with equal... Um, interesting sharpness or clarity. And you know, it's, it's an advantage that, that painting definitely has that makes it fun. It's got its own little power, its own super, for, super power right there. OK, so perspective, straight lines. You know, here's another kind of a little dark shape that goes right up against his shirt. And then maybe it gets a little lighter, and we put a little rectangle there. And we could, you know, depending on how, um, how much time we have or how much I want to go, you know, you can keep just, oh, good, good. That'll be perfect because we'll, we'll be able to let this dry just a tidbit, Tad. And, um, and then we'll pull out our one last trick, which is also another old master trick, okay? Um, Few more darks. Let's uh, let's come over here. You know, like right where that floor is. There's sort of a line, kind of right about here, and uh, it, we could carry that all the way over to there. Uh, she's got her leg in shadow, which eh, we could make it look like that. This other leg in the reproduction and in the photos that I saw, couldn't really see it very well, honestly. Um, but I'm just going to continue this dark all the way over to the corner. Um, and then I'm going to just gradate it to the other color. So get that dark and gradate. Gradate. Gradating is part of the magic, folks, believe it or not. Um, gradations. It's one of those things, like you don't have to know physics to catch a baseball and to do all the calculations that are involved in charting a parabola uh, from 100 feet away and how fast are you running and how fast is the ball moving and what's the air resistance and this and that. You don't have to know all that stuff to catch a baseball, you know. And, um, and there was something related to that with painting. <laughs> Uh, gradation, that's right. Okay, looking good. Uh, maybe, I've, maybe I'm going to break up a few more, kind of uh, put, put some more darks up in here. Maybe um, I'm going to put a little dark right up in there and then get a hard edge. And, and, uh, and then go radiate. With the uh, acrylic, I'm, I'm not using a Stay Wet palette this time. Um, 
But look at that, look at that. We got some dynamics going on on our acrylic underpainting. You could certainly uh, say that at least we're, tr at least it's gotten closer to the painting or the uh, phot photograph that we're, that we're copying. And, um, you know, at this point, how, how much more refinement do you want to get? How, many, how much more subtle? Uh, we've totally lost our grid, okay? The grid has vanished um, because we've painted it over, which is what happens with painting. It's an, most of the time, it's an additive process. We're adding to it and we cover. Um, get a little line here, maybe another little line there. You know, you can get a few perspective suggestions. Um, it seems to be there's maybe a vertical here. There's something going across there. Uh, the wonderful magic of just gradating to black is always a nice thing. Um, and so this will this will dry. I mean, it's already mostly dry. Okay, if I kind of like uh, roll even even like roll a little paper towel over it or something like that, that'll start to pick up some of those wet spots. Um, most of the time, I don't try to hurry things too much. I don't I don't find the need to hurry. Um, and uh, but so you know, blowing a hair dryer on this, it would certainly make it dry a little bit quicker. And is that what you need to have happen? I don't know. Um, but what I want to show you, and the reason that we're going to make this, uh, we'll just sort of talk for a minute and then show you this last trick, is you got to understand, you got to get over your, the fear that comes with losing something through the process of painting. Like, oh, I'm going to lose the grid that I drew that's helping me block in the paint and put something on this composition. Oh, if I drew my line drawing, I'm going to lose my line drawing if I start putting color on it. And, um, you know, it's like, a, it's a big fear that we have. We're going to lose it. Um, don't have it. There's so many ways that you can avoid losing that, or that you can get over that fear of losing something. And um, so what we're going to show you right now, if I just move a couple of things off the side here, is uh, let me just take this off. All right, we're going to put it right back where it was because we got these little whatevers. But there's something in the, the old masters, they made something that was called a cartoon. Okay, and a cartoon back in the day, in the academic tradition of painting or whatever, a cartoon was not like SpongeBob. A cartoon was a full sized final line drawing that was usually destroyed in the process of using it for its function. Um, like if you, were, if you were doing a big fresco painting, you would have a full size cartoon of the image that you were just about to paint in fresco and it would be four by five feet or whatever was the size that you were going to be painting. And what we've made for this, we've made a cartoon for, uh, for this image that we're gonna, and we're gonna use transfer paper, which is another technique for getting an image onto the canvas. So we first generally blocked it in using the squaring up, and we got our lights and darks, and we got them pretty close to getting somewhere close to what we're trying to do. All right, as you can see on the canvas, it didn't, it's not a big complicated thing. And uh, now, watch this guy's special trick, okay? What we did is we went to Kinko's and we made a copy that is 100% the same size. Keep it on the, on the close up. 100% the same size, all right, as what we're trying to copy, all right? And we can just lay this right on top of our painting. Now, back in the day, uh, this might have been, instead of a photograph, because we're, we're working with a photograph, this might have been your drawing. Or this, this could have been whatever, a collection, a series of drawings. Um, but what we're able to do, it's taped onto the top. So it's always just perfectly lined up. 
and we flip it over, all right, and we're just gonna, we'll, we'll stick this back up here, and then we're gonna show you another little magic thing. Five minutes, perfect! I had another push pin, but then of course I put it down and I misplaced it. Ah, no, it's okay. Um, so guys, transfer paper. You could either, like, what, what could you do? You could rub graphite on the back of the piece of paper right here. You could rub graphite, charcoal. Um, you can buy transfer paper. They make big rolls of it. Uh, you can make your own transfer paper, which is what I did. And uh, so I just got a, this is like a bill or a, you know, there's like you get a bill and there's always this page was left intentionally blank. So I used that blank page and I just put some gloves on and I rubbed it really hard with charcoal, like rubbed it in and uh, smashed that charcoal in there. So it's really like none of this is shaking loose like it could because I just rubbed it in with my fingers hard. And what we can do with this now is you can just, here, let me grab a, a pencil. Sorry for ducking out of frame, guys. But I, I'm still in the frame. Um, I gotta find a pencil. Does anyone have a pencil? Um, what else could I use since we're not getting a pencil here in any time soon? Uh, here's another little thingy. Okay, so what we do is we stick this transfer paper between the drawing and our surface. And you just lay it right down. And here, I'll take this little stick here. And you can be neater than I am, okay? But I'm, I just drew a line for where the top of that table is. And now I'm gonna draw a line to where the side of that table is. And now I'm gonna draw a line for where the back of it is and the, f the front. And I'm gonna draw a little line that shows where his knuckles are and uh, the edge of the desk. And then what you'll see when I lift this up magically is my line transferred onto the canvas where things actually need to be. You see what I'm saying? Nice trick. All right, um, so uh, how much do I need to transfer? Eh, not that much. Like maybe I just need to know like where the top of his head is. And I can just, just like if I, the top of his head and then the bottom of his nose and his chin, and that would be enough right there. That's where I need to move him for him to be in the, in the right proportion. Where is the tip of her toe? Maybe that's something I need to know. So I'm going to draw a little triangle right there. That's the, where the tip of her toe is. Ooh, I got that one almost right on the dot. Not bad. You know, so every now and then you eyeball it in the right place, or you don't, but it doesn't matter. Also, guys, you could make white transfer paper or any color transfer paper, not just black charcoal. You could write gray pastel or green or pink or whatever, if you're transferring lines down and you can't see it because it's black and you've got black charcoal transfer paper, make a piece of gray chalk or white chalk transfer paper and then you can just transfer that, uh, that line onto that dark surface just as easily. So um, those are two tricks that you guys can use and uh, pick an image, Do, uh, find a nice photograph, maybe you've got a nice photograph. Make it black and white if it isn't already, and um, play around with squaring up and playing around with your values. Guys, this has been episode eight of, or this is the eighth show that we've done of Paint with Alex. So that's officially a season. I don't know if we're gonna take like a couple of weeks off or something like that and regroup and uh, you know sell this to YouTube Red or something like that. My producer's gonna work on all that. It's gonna be awesome. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, 